I'm your host, Kurt Sandig, and welcome to Paranormal Almanac. That's right, I'm your host, Kurt Sandvig, and on this week's edition of Paranormal Almanac, let's take a look at Bigfoot in a completely different way than any other podcast or TV show ever, I think. I don't think this has been done before, but first, shout-outs. Shout-outs going out to Aaron, Aaron, Amber, Amy, Angie, Austin, Autumn, Brody, Seth, Carolyn, Chuck, Dan, Daniel, David, Devin, Dill, Edgar, Elliot, Erica, Aaron, Fabian, Harvey, Harley, Heidi, J. Mark, Jade, Jaime, Jason, Jason, Jeff, Jenny, Jennifer, Jim, Joe, John, Joshua, Joshua, Juliana, Kelsey, Kenny, Kira, Kyle, Kyle, Laura, Laura Rutho, Lauren McCune, hey, Lawrence, Leo, Lindsay, M. Caballero, Madison, Maggie, hey Maggie, Michaela Manning, Martin, Matt, Matt, Megan, Megan, Milo, Nanashi, Nick, Pablo, Peaches the Cat, hell yes, I love that one, Rachel, Reed, Richard, Rosa, Sage, Sarah, Sarah, Shelly, Suzanne, Tosh, Todd, Jamie, and Elijah Hendrickson, Travis, Trey, Troy, Veronica, and Vincente, but first we have to go back to Peaches the mother effing cat, how awesome is that? Thank you, Peaches. And I'm assuming whoever Peaches lives with, but mostly Peaches. Alrighty. If you want to be like the cool kids, head on over to patreon.com slash paranormal almanac. A lot of new episodes are been have been put up recently. I've got another new episode in the pipeline for my patrons. I'm hoping to get it out this week, but this week looks really busy, so we'll see how I go, but I do have one just about finished. So let's head on over to Paranormal News. Paranormal News. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Paranormal News. First up in Paranormal News, Carnegie Science Center to host Stranger Things event exploring paranormal science. On Friday the 13th, the portal to the Upside Down is opening up at the Science Center. Stranger Things is a 21 and above event at the Carnegie Service Center, nope, Carnegie Science Center, and it's inspired by Stranger Things. The event scheduled for the unlucky date of September the 13th, Friday, September the 13th, will run from 6 to 10 p.m. And according to the Science Center's website, there'll be activities that explore paranormal and supernatural science featured in the hit show Stranger Things. Some of the events include trying to decode the Russian broadcast picked up at the beginning of Season 3, an 80s lip-sync battle, and Eggo syrup-flavored ice cream frozen in liquid nitrogen. You're encouraged to dress up in Stranger Things attire, so get ready to bust out your scrunchies and Camp Nowhere t-shirts. You can buy tickets online. That's in Pittsburgh. Sounds like it'll be a lot of fun. I was hoping for more paranormal stuff, but uh, still, sounds like it's going to be a blast. Up next, best ever video of headless ghost in white stalking house goes viral after terrified owners call cops a mysterious intruder. Now, I've not watched the video yet, but apparently there's a video showing a headless ghost in a long white dress. It's been dubbed the best ever by, quote, fans of the paranormal. Now, it was shown on the Travel Channel's Ghost of Morgan City's TV show, in which a team investigators check out claims of ghostly activities. In the, in the video, a figure can be seen walking past the entrance to the living room at a house in Patterson, Los Angeles. So, enough with this crap, let's watch this video. Okay, it's a video of a living room. There's a funky looking sofa, kind of in the foreground. You can tell in the background, it must be like a kitchen or something. Somebody walks by, looks like an old lady in a white outfit. And I was here watching it live, I know for a fact. Nobody came in or out of that house, and I was watching it live as I'm reviewing these EVPs. I have never, ever seen anything like this on TV, out of TV, anything I've ever done. This is a full 
freaking body apparition <laughs> all the way down with the dress down to the ground yeah it looks like somebody in a dress walks by they're not see-through they're not headless i don't understand what uh, i'm not getting why they're saying they're headless uh doesn't look see-through doesn't look headless i wasn't there i can't tell you if this is legit though which you know take it with a grain of salt but if it's legit that's pretty okay it's cool buddy that is pretty terrifying i gotta admit but i don't know if i necessarily believe it's ex it uh i don't know if they definitely believe that it's legit okay up next in paranormal news single haunted taxi is cruising the streets of osaka until the end of august so running out of time here it's like a haunted house on wheels except you can't choose when to ride the esp taxi it chooses you from the 16th to the 31st of August, so again, just a few more days left, Osaka is being haunted by a taxi like no other. The ESP Taxi, Curse of the Spirit Ring. And it can be seen prowling the streets in search of souls brave, brave enough to use it for their transportation needs. This is the second year My Light Taxi has run the ESP Taxi in the blistering summer months of August. As is the custom in Japan, scary tales and frights that send shivers down one spine are often a cost-effective way to keep cool in the intent... Well, that's just dumb. So, of their 642 active cabs in Osaka, there is only one ESP taxi. This taxi cannot be reserved either. It can only be hailed by chance if it happens to be in your area. You will notice it by the bloody magnet placard on the door that reads ESP. So, this seems funny. This seems cool. Seems kind of cheesy, but I dig it. I wish they would do stuff like that in L.A. Okay, and finally, in paranormal news, woman sues archdiocese after a layman exorcism leaves her emotionally damaged. A woman in Texas is suing the archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, and her parish, claiming she suffered psychological and emotional abuse through a layman-led exorcism during a retreat. Beth Ann Andrews filed her lawsuit on July 25th after attending a Faith in the Fire event, which is associated with the Catholic Charismatic Movement. Now, according to its website, the Faith in the Fire retreat provides its participants the opportunity to reconnect with what matters and share their faith journeys in a loving community. The whole purpose of me attending the retreat was to get close to God and the Catholic faith. Now, she said she wasn't informed that exorcisms would be performed by the layman leader of the retreat. According to church law, exorcisms can only be performed by authorized personnel, but the church has published a book of, quote, prayers against the powers of darkness that can be used by anyone. Andrews told the television station that the retreat leader abused his powers and authority by inappropriately discussing sexual topics. She is seeking monetary damages and a change of archdiocene policy when it comes to training layman leadership. St. Anthony of Padua Catholic Church in the Woodlands, the parish named in the suit, responded to the accusations, the parishioner plaintiff alleges she was subject to non-physical, psychological, and emotional abuse by a lay volunteer. The parishioner further alleges that the archdiocese and the parish failed to properly train and supervise said volunteer. So that's a fucked up uh, exorcism. First of all, if you're going on a, a retreat or a camp or whatever, and you need an exorcism, because I it, I don't think they just started doing the exorcism on her. I'm sure that she was that everybody's like, hey, do we have any volunteers? And she's like, well, yeah, I need an exorcism. I wanna I wanna see God. And then yeah, the guy seemed to get kind of creepy. Terrible story all around. Kind of creepy, but it did have an exorcism that happened. So of course I had to talk about it. All right, let's take a quick break and get past all these weird-ass stories this week and get right into this week's story. Okay, on this edition, I thought I would do something a little different. Something I couldn't find anywhere, and if it has been done before, it's such a good idea that I thought I came up with it myself. And I think I did come up with this myself. Again, I tried to find out if anyone else has ever done this before. I couldn't find it, and... Even so, I'm going to do it anyways. I did all of this work. I'm not going to stop now. What we're going to do for this week's edition is we're going to tell some tales of Sasquatch encounters, but we're going to tell them verbatim as they appeared in newspaper articles at that time. No BS websites to sift through to see what's true. No misquotes or frankly made up newspaper articles just so they can have some kind of story 
and try to justify their BS articles. No, just the actual newspaper articles as they appeared at the time. Now, I'll admit, when I came up with this idea, I had no idea if I would find one or 1,000 articles that were worth sharing. But I gotta say, I was really surprised just how many there were. I scoured through hundreds of actual newspaper articles. Thankfully, they have a search feature now, so it made it a lot easier, but I still had to scour through them. And I have to say, it is worth the monthly fee because now, anytime someone mentions a newspaper article, I can find that very same article and research or most times debunk what these websites are saying. Now, when I did it before, I would go, all right, this this stupid website says they have an article from the Glendale Gazette in 1967. So I would go to Glendale Gazette, I would go to their archives, I would pay their archive fee, and I would just scour through 1967 hoping I didn't miss it. Now, with this newspapers.com website, it's freaking easy, it's freaking cool, they're not paying me, in fact, I'm paying them to use this. But it made it really cool to just go Sasquatch and then go through every Sasquatch article ever written. And let me tell you, there are a ton of them. Now, the first one I can find is from March 1847. Now, it's mentioned in an article about Skookums, which is an early name for Sasquatch. And that's S-K-O-O-C-O-O-M-S. What I did was I tried to find every name given to Sasquatch, Bigfoot, Yowie, Yeti, whatever you want to call them. And I went through every one of them to see what I could find. And what did I find? Well, I found an article from March 1847. And it says, In March of 1847, Paul Kane wrote in his journal, Wanderings of an Artist, When we arrived at the mouth of the Catapultal River, 26 miles from Fort Vancouver, I stopped to make a sketch of the volcano. Mount St. Helens, distant, I suppose about 30 or 40 miles. This mountain has never been visited by either whites or Indians. The latter assert it is inhabited by a race of beings of a different species who are cannibals and whom they hold in great dread. These superstitions are taken from the statement of a man who they say went to the mountain with another and escaped the fate of his companion who was eaten by the skookums or evil genie. I offered a considerable bribe to any Indian who would accompany me in its exploration, but could not find one hardy enough to venture. So, already an amazing start. Now, I've heard many stories about Bigfoot being wiped out when Mount St. Helens erupted. Really hope that's not true. But, I can't believe that I found someone, I found an article from 1847 that talks about this same topic. But, as far as actual full articles, Let's start with the Weekly Arkansas Gazette from Little Rock, Arkansas, May 30th, 1851. And the article's called, A Wild Man of the Woods. The Memphis Inquirer gives an account of a wild man recently discovered in Arkansas. It appears that during March last, during March last, Mr. Hamilton of Greene County, Arkansas, while hunting with an acquaintance, observed a drove of cattle in a state of apparent alarm, evidently pursued by some dreaded enemy. Halting for the purpose, they soon discovered, as the animals fled by them, that they were followed by an animal bearing the unmistakable likeness of humanity. He was of a gigantic stature, the body being covered with hair, and on the head was long locks that fairly enveloped his neck and shoulders. The, quote, wild man, after looking at them deliberately for a short time, turned and ran away with great speed, leaping from 12 to 14 feet at a time. His footsteps measured 13 inches each. This singular creature, the Inquirer says, has long been known traditionally in St. Francis Green and Poinsett Counties, Arkansas. Sportsmen and hunters have described him 17 years since. A planter indeed saw him very recently, but withheld his information lest he should not be credited until the account of Mr. Hamilton and his friend placed the existence of the animal beyond cavil, whatever that means. A great deal of interest is felt in the matter by the inhabitants of that region and various, con and various conjectures have been ventured in regard to him. The most genuinely entertained idea appears to be that he was a survivor of the earthquake disaster 
which desolated that region in 1841. Thrown helpless upon the wilderness by that disaster, it is probable that he grew up in his savage state until he now bears only the outward resemblance of humanity. So well authenticated have now become the accounts of this creature that an expedition is organized in Memphis by Colonel David C. Cross and Dr. Sullivan to scout for him. That is a real newspaper article from May 30th, 1851 in Arkansas here in the United States. Again, a full hundred and what, 15 years, 110 years before the Patterson-Gimlin film that pretty much solidified that Bigfoot were real. Okay, from there, let's go to the Southern Shield. That's the name of the newspaper. It's in Helena, Arkansas on May 1st, 1852. The Wild Man again. We are credibly informed by a gentleman of this city that the Wild Man has been seen again in the swamps of Arkansas. He derived his information from two gentlemen who were out hunting and approached as near as 20 paces to him. His appearance was so frightful that they did not attempt to approach nearer. He is described by them as being about 7 feet 2 inches high and covered completely with black hair interspersed now and then with gray. The story or the representations of him as last seen published in some of our papers they pronounced untrue. They said he has no claws to his hands and feet nor is he 8 or 9 foot tall. Still he would be a curiosity worth seeing. We understand it is the intention of some of our citizens to capture him if possible. In the way of shows, he would be, quote, the wild mare with the, quote, hippodrome thrown in. So a lot of weird crap on that one. But right after the first one, what, like less than a year, almost a year to the day, actually, from the first one, this wild man was seen again in the same area. So Arkansas apparently had a Sasquatch that they were seeing on a fairly regular basis. Okay, from there, let's go to the Washington Standard in Olympia, Washington, August 27th, 1880. A veritable monstrosity. The wild man of the woods found in the forest of Oregon. Long years ago, when the first settlers came to Oregon, there were stories told that the new to the newcomers of the existence of a monster that had been seen in the wilds of the Coast Range. He wandered over every part of the vast domain between the mouth of the Rogue River and the Columbia, going as far east as the Willamette River and the boundless ocean on the west. When the people began to settle the rich fields and vales of this part, this monster went deeper and deeper into the wilderness and was only seen at long intervals as some venturesome hunter would suddenly come across him in the mighty jungle of forests that covered his vast range. His appearance, frightful in the extreme, would so inspire his beholder with terror that in his fear he would make all haste to leave that spot of horror with only the indistinct remembrance of the vision he had beheld of the greatest monster on earth. That's just a great sentence. Whoever wrote this, bravo, that is a great sentence. And it, it's still true to this day. People get so freaked out, so scared by Sasquatch, they can't even remember most of the encounter. Uh, let's see, it keeps going. Uh, his story told by the campfire on his return to his comrades would only be hooted at and we'd, he would retire amid their derision for being such a coward. And the story goes on to talk about uh, the tales and the myths. I'm not going to go through this every story constantly, but it was it was searched for a party of tourists and hunters from California to meet him face to face. And to them, they were all indebted for the tale of their adventure. Two weeks ago on a party of four renowned as mighty hunters of the Grizzly and the Sierras came ashore from the Oregon and took the boat for Nebelum Valley. Intent, intent on being the first to tread many portions of this wild country, they went on and on deep into the wilderness. One day last week when they were far from the mighty Columbia, they sent out their dogs to chase the game and each took a stand by a quote run. One more full of curiosity and adventure than the rest began to, began to look around and soon he saw in the soft mud near the springs the print of a monster foot. But one track was visible, but its size, its resemblance to a human foot, made him start back in horror to clench his trusty gun as he held his bated breath. He remembered the stories he had heard and called his companions and hounds around him. They decided to give the monster chase, no rest until he had been brought to bay. The track in the mud was shown to the dogs and soon their deep bang beckoned that they had found their quarry. On through the tangled woods rushed the men, and soon they were face to face with the horrible form that had haunted this place for years. Of giant height, with hair falling and grizzled locks, 
his arms of the size of saplings and covered with a coarse red hair all over his body, he stood facing the men with an expression of hate and ferocity. His teeth were set and two long tusks on each side show what life would be of little worth to anything into which they might be set. And with the sweep of his long arm, one of the baying hounds was caught up and those terrible tusks went crashing through its quivering brain. Ugh, I don't like that part of the story. Uh, the remaining dogs saw what happened. They freaked out and ran away. Then the hunters basically freaked out and ran away too. Uh, ba -ba -ba, I don't like that part. His track was measured and found to be 27 inches in length. His height was estimated by measuring a small tree near which he stood and found to be 11 feet and 5 inches. His terrible eyes and ferocious teeth, that grinning mouth, and the swelling muscles of his body so inspired the hunters with a wholesome fear that they returned to the city on last Wednesday morning, returned to their own state, content to hunt the grizzly and mountain sheep amid the hills and rocks of the Sierra Nevada. Okay, I wanted to read that last line because it's very important. These were experienced hunters who knew what grizzly looked like. This was not a grizzly bear. This was something completely different. And this one seemed to have a reddish hair to it. Unfortunately, it also seemed to have killed one of their hunting dogs. So I don't like that Bigfoot. Okay, up next is the North Adams transcript. And that's in North Adams, Massachusetts, August 23rd, 1895. Built like a horse, wild man creates terror among farmers around Injun Meadow. Look, 1895. I'm not saying the word Injun Meadow. They said it in this newspaper in 1895. It goes on to say he scares brutes as well as human beings. Something to organize and make a determined effort at capture. I can't really read that word. Um forced to organize i don't know it's it's an old newspaper you know give it give me some breaks it's from 1895 i can't read it all it goes on to say that the wild man was seen again yesterday by passengers of dodd's stage en route to winstead from something massachusetts something with an s sandsfield maybe he was in the same track of brush as when seen last saturday by 17 no by selectman smith which is five miles from here on the old and lonesome highway leading to Colebrook. The wild man lives in Injun Meadow, as it's known to the countrymen. He is thought to be one of a family of three wild men seen two years ago. The man seen by Mr. Smith had no clothes, but was covered with hair. The wild man was seen in Cannon Mountain a few months ago, is thought to be the same person. Farmers in that section are terrorized and afraid to go out of the doors after dark, and the robberies of Henry's and mysterious disappearances of calves, lambs, and even Sandusfield and Colebrook's farms are blamed upon the wild man. 500 men leave here Sunday morning to hunt for the strange character. They will go out in gangs and surround Injun Meadow and Cobble Mountain. And Cobble Mountain farmers have given the use of their, of their teams free while every man of the posse is warned to go armed. On Saturday, Riley Smith, while coming over the road, stopped to pick a few berries, but no sooner has he commenced to eat them that the wild man emerged from the center of the batch of berry bushes. Smith was about as scared to death. His dog commenced to whine, and with its tail between its legs, sought refuge in Smith's wagon under a pile of blankets. Mr. Smith described the man as an awful-looking sight. He is large in stature, and his head is the most conspicuous part of the body, being nearly the size of a horse's head. His teeth remember, resemble those of a horse in size, but are pointed, and his hands are extra large. So again, 1895, great descriptions. It, I, checked for, I checked to see if like the next week's or two week's articles would bring up this wild man again, because 500 people went out hunting for this thing. As far as I can find, they never found him. As you know, we go by a certain saying here, don't fucking shoot Bigfoot. So I'm very glad that it seems, it appears, that in 1895, 500 men went out to try and shoot Bigfoot, but they didn't. They never found him. I dig that one. And this one, again, is in Winston, Connecticut. So across the country, they're seeing Sasquatches on that side of the country, too. And again, in 1895, it's, or 1899, that's absolutely amazing. Oh, wait, was that 1899? No, it was 1895. I was right the first time. Yeah, that is absolutely incredible. Okay, from there, though, 
We're going to go to the North Adams transcript, same newspaper, July 20th, 1899. Four years later, Portland, Maine, July 20th. There is a wild man sensation on Peaks Island, Portland Harbor. Campers report having seen a strangely acting person the past day or two who has disappeared in the woods when approached. Last evening, a young couple were badly frightened by evidently the same individual who suddenly sprang before them and then made off into the underbrush with sharp cries like those of a frightened dog. Very short article, but I'm not saying there's only one Bigfoot in that area, but it wouldn't be out of character for Bigfoot to get away from Injun Meadows when 500 people were hunting for him and head on over to Peaks Island in Portland Harbor. And that's in Portland, Maine is this one. So again, 1899, seems like there's a lot of sightings of Bigfoots and we're not even into the 1900s yet. Alrighty, from March 3rd, 1934, we're going to jump ahead a little bit. From the Edmonton Journal in Canada comes this story. Page Jack, the giant killer, Indian sees weird Sasquatch. That's the headline. It's in Harris, Harrison Mills, British Columbia, March 3rd. Indian children stayed close to their mother's apron strings Friday for the fearsome Sasquatch had returned to spread terror through the peace-loving, I'm going to get this wrong and I apologize, Native Americans or indigenous first people, Chahalis tribe, I think it's Chahalis, C-H-E-H-A-L-I-S tribes. Stories of these hairy creatures, men and women, are among the weirdest of the tribal legends, but none had been seen for 30 years until it was whispered recently through the Indian lodges that the dreaded wild men of the Chahalis hills were again on the prowl. Then Frank Dan saw a Sasquatch investigating the persistent barking of his dog at night. Dan came face to face with a hairy giant who, according to Dan, was tall and muscular, prowling in the nude. He was covered with black hair from head to foot, except for a small space around the eyes. Frank ran breathlessly into the house and secured the door. Peeking through the window, he saw the giant stride leisurely into the nearby brush and disappear. I don't know who Paige Jack the Giant Killer is, according to this. I mean, apparently he's the Indian, but I mean, it doesn't even mention him in the article. So as crazy as that headline is, that's about all that comes up for Sasquatch in said article. All right, next up is March 17th, 1934, from the province newspaper in Vancouver, Canada. Indians tell of encounter with monsters. Sasquatch unwelcome visitor... In Chahalas country, I oh, man, I should learn how to say Chahalas country. Hold on, I need to find out how badly I'm messing this up. Chahalas pronunciation. You guys can learn along with me. Chahalas, Chahalas. All right, wasn't too bad. Chahalas, Chahalas Hills, Chahalas Native Americans or first indigenous people. I forgot we're in Canada. Okay, Sasquatch unwelcome visitors in Chahalas country. In Chahalas country. Since Frank Dan's recent encounter with the Sasquatch hairy giants at the Chehalis Forest, Indians recalled many legends concerning their previous experiences with the strange monsters. One Indian recounted how, a few years ago, he had heard a noise that sounded like the grunt of a pig. When he looked around, he saw a huge Sasquatch crouching on a boulder within 30 feet of him. The Indian's presence evidently annoyed the giant who uttered a piercing yell and started in pursuit. The Indian managed to escape by chance, it says by cants, but I think they mean by chance, leaving the Sasquatch shouting incoherent imprecations at him from the shore. That was not the end of the incident, however, for soon after the Indian had returned to his home, the giant appeared. Like a big wind, Sasquatch put his shoulder to the side of the old house and shook it like a big wind, said the Indian. Man, I hate saying the word Indian, I apologize. I could see him through a chink in the wall, he was six feet tall, his nose was broad and flat, and his forehead very low. When I measured his tracks in the dust, the footprints were 22 inches long and very narrow. I had locked the house so he could not get in. By and by, he went away. Old, not going to say it, Native Americans said the Sasquatch were often seen years ago, saying that the Sasquatch often entered a house when there was nobody around and helped themselves to whatever they fancied. On a Sunday, some years ago, when most of the people were in church, a Sasquatch entered the village and seeing that all was quiet and nobody was about, went into one of the houses, but a Native American who did not go to church saw the giant come out carrying some bread and smoked salmon. He shot him in the arm, boo, and the giant leapt into the air and then ran through the woods to safety. Old Charlie tells of meeting a Sasquatch at a swimming pool near Yale when he was a young man. 
as Charlie and several un uh, I apologize. I'm just going to say Indian because I can't keep changing this while I'm trying to read it to you clearly. Um, again, it's 19, whatever it was, 1934. Uh... They saw Sasquatch standing behind a boulder looking at them. Charlie went up to talk to him, but the giant slouched into the bush. Two weeks later, Charlie and some other men ran into the giant at the same place. Charlie says that this giant did not seem as wild as some he met later when he was hunting in the mountains several miles beyond the... Hatatic? Can't really read what that says. Old Charlie tells the story. I was hunting in the mountains beyond... Hatzik, maybe? H-A-T... That might be a Z-I-C. He says, I had my dog with me. I came out on a flat where there were several large cedar trees. The dog stood before one of the big trees and began to growl and bark. He was a clever dog. On looking up to see what he was the, see what the trouble was, I noticed a large hole in the tree seven or eight feet from the ground. The dog pawed and leapt upon the trunk and looked at me as if to lift him up, which I did. And he went into the hole, and then I heard a cry inside. I said to myself, that dog is tearing into a bear and I stood with my rifle ready. I called to Enoch, the dog, to drive him out, and out came something I took for a bear in my excitement. I shot, and the thing fell to the ground. I was horrified that I had shot a naked boy. However, he was not badly hurt. Just then, a female Sasquatch stepped out of the bush, strangest and the wildest creature I ever saw. I raised my rifle not to shoot, but to defend myself if necessary. The hairy creature, for that's what it was, walked fearless, fearlessly towards me. The wild creature was a woman. Her face was almost black and her hair swept to her waist. She was a giant in height, at least six feet, and built in proportion. She looked savagely at me and then picked up the wounded boy and vanished. Indians are under the impression that the Sasquatch don't leave their mountain caverns except when food is scarce. They believe that the giants hypnotize their prey. You know, that's going to come up, um, the hypnotize the prey part is actually going to come up again and again in these stories. And I know I've heard that, I've heard that in the past, I'm sure you guys have heard it in the past, but to hear it from people who actually were there, who actually saw them, especially that long ago, again, is very interesting. Okay, from there, let's go to the April 9th, 1934, Los Angeles Times. Fabled Baby Snatcher Sought. America's first Sasquatch catching expedition heads into the wilds of British Columbia on hunt for the horrible, hairy, naked bogeyman of the Indian legend. And there's actually a cartoon with this one that says, Help, everyone, there's a Sasquatch. And it's the other guy rep responds with, Bosh, I'm one of the expedition. I just haven't shaved for a week. Womp womp. Okay. April 8th. America's first Sasquatch catching expedition headed into the mountains of British Columbia today on a hunt for the horrible, hairy, naked boogeyman of the Indian legend. J.F. Blackney and C.K. Blackney, brothers of Sacramento, medical students at the University of California, read reports of frightened tribesmen that the giant baby snatcher of old had been seen recently in the mountains north of Harrison Lake and determined to attempt to photograph or lasso a Sasquatch. The fabled Sasquatch, as described in Indian lore for hundreds of years, is about as villainous a phantasm as ever frightened a little papoose anywhere, but adult Indians are also fearful of the monsters. They're supposed to lurk in the caves and glades of the British Columbia, coming out in the twilight to peer moodily into Indian teepees, to glower and snatch at children, to steal food, and play... That one doesn't make any sense. And, and play... Dis I don't know. I can't read that word. And play something. I don't know what they're playing, but that's what they're doing. Our professor of anthropology will be much interested, said the Black Knees, as they left for the haunts of the Sasquatch. British Columbia is a happy hunting ground for weird legends, and there is no lack of witnesses who will swear to them, as hundreds have sworn that they have seen Ogopogo, the sheep-headed freshwater serpent of Lake Oganagan, and the two, and the two big saltwater sea serpents, Hayashaluk, and Cadborosaurus. Cadborosaurus we've talked about, Ogopogo we've talked about, but I've never heard of Hayashaluk. I'm going to have to look into that. But this one says Cadborosaurus and his wife Amy. There's a lot in that little article right there. Holy crap. A bunch of baby snatch and Sasquatches playing with something, and then they talk about sea serpents as well? This is in the Los Angeles Times. I don't know what page it was on. Page 2 of the Los Angeles Times, April 9th, 1934. Wow, there's a lot of crazy cool stuff that happened on this day. Hmm. 
Alrighty, anyhow, I, got, I can't uh, I can't get caught up in the uh, in the advertisements. Up uh, next up from again from the province from May twenty first, nineteen thirty four. That's the province newspaper in Vancouver, Canada. You're gonna hear a lot from them, to be honest with you. Whoop, nope, I'm starting that one over. Woman backed into tub of suds as humming Sasquatch tries to hypnotize her. Yeah, that's the headline. Harrison Mills, May 21st. After an absence of six weeks, the fearsome Sasquatch have appeared in this district again. The latest visitation from the strange, mysterious band of hairy giants said to live in caverns in the mountains was in broad daylight one day last week. Mrs. James Caulfield reports that she was washing clothes in a rivulet that runs close to Tommy Alex's garden at Chehalis, I said that right this time, when she thought she heard something buzzing. The sort of a noise a hummingbird makes when it's dancing before a flower. She says, I turned my head to have a look at the pretty bird, but instead of a bird, there stood the most terrible thing I ever saw in my life. I thought I'd die for the thing that made the funny noise was a big man covered with hair from head to foot. He was looking at me, and I couldn't help looking at him. I guessed he was a Sasquatch, so I covered my eyes with my hands, for the Indians say that if the Sasquatch catches your eye, you're in his power. I felt faint as I backed away to get to the house. I went plop into the tub of suds. The Sasquatch disappeared in the bush. His height, Mrs. Caulfield said, running her eyes along the trunk of an alder, would be about as high as that knot of the tree. That knot was an inch or two less than six feet from the ground. Okay, that's not that tall. Six feet, come on. But still, hypnotized by a Sasquatch as she backed into a tub of suds and the Sasquatch was humming. That one is a weird one. I would love to see if I could find a Mrs. James Caulfield in like Ancestry.com or something. See if I could find any of her descendants because... This has got to be a story that was shared by crazy grandma, Mrs. James Caulfield. You know what else I would have liked? To actually have her first name and not just being known as Mrs. James Caulfield. That would have been swell. But again, I'd love to know like what it was like to grow up and hear grandma tell the tale of being of some Sasquatch trying to hypnotize her. I think that one is a cool one for a completely batshit crazy reasons. Alrighty, next we go to July 29th, 19, 1934 from the Decatur Daily Review, and it was reprinted in the Lincoln Star on the same day, and then again in August 1934 by the Courier Journal in Louisville, Kentucky. Now this was from page 42, it has a great story on a Sasquatch. I found a lot of these, I mean it was the early 1900s and the late 1800s where one newspaper will have it, the very next day another one, and then boom, 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 and I could just keep finding the same exact article throughout the country. You could watch it go across the country, basically. But this one is from the very first printing that I could find, and that's July 29th, 1934, from the Decatur Daily Review. Again, it has an awesome title. It actually has an awesome, almost like magazine kind of quality page for the entire thing. At the top of it, it has a map of, well, it's got a map of Canada. It says it shows Chilliwack and Harrison Mills, and British Columbia, but there's drawings of Bigfoot around Chilliwack, around Harrison Mills, around Yale. And then it says, are they the last cavemen? Every four years, a strange race of giants is reported at various places in British Columbia. They are reported this year as shown on the map. And again, they were, shown, uh, they were seen in Yale, Harrison Mills, and Chilliwack. And it shows um, Millie Saw of the Chehalis Reserve had a harrowing experience with the this is why it was a little bit hard for me to find this one. They call it a Sasquatch. S-A-S-W-U-A-T-C-H. Not Sasquatch. But later in the article, it does correct the spelling. But um, there was a lot of misspellings in this article. Several nights later, she heard a prowler and glancing up, saw him rubbing his hand over the window panes. She screamed and the giant visitor disappeared. They have, they, have a show, they have a photo, it looks like, of one of the entrances of the Great Caves, thought to be the home of some of the giant Sasquatch. I would love to go to those. It was clear that this Indian house where the first Sasquatch reported seen years ago, the house was abandoned. And then it shows some mountains with a little arrow on it that says every four years, great columns of fire are seen on certain mountain types thought to be signals from the Sasquatch. The arrow shows where one of the signal fires comes from. That's very interesting. The whole article is by Francis Dickey and it is 
Peculiar in keeping with this topsy-turvy year of violent, varying weather, universal human unrest, droughts, grasshopper plagues, and other phenomena, that there now comes from various eyewitnesses the reports of seeing some of the Sasquatch, those weird hairy men reported for 20 years to dwell in the tremendous and unexplored mountain regions of British Columbia, Canada. Their reported return is particularly in keeping with this unusual year, so remarkable for the number of appearances of various startling monsters sighted from Scotland to the Caribbean, from the Pacific to the Mediterranean, the reality of which is affirmed by scores of eyewitnesses. Moreover, the statements of some of these people in as so far as curious denizens of the oceans are concerned have been borne out for within a short time of each other at the birthplaces of the European coast, the mountains of incredible monsters have finally been cast up. It's really hard to read that part. This guy loves to flourish this story. The next, the next chapter starts with the existence of a troglodytic race inhabiting the mountains of British Columbia. In many of the vast caves is a tribal legend among the Chehalis, Chehalis Indians and those of the Squaw Reservation near Chilliwack in the Harrison Lake District, which is about 100 miles east of Vancouver. Among the Indians, the race has been known for centuries by the name Sasquatch or Hairy Men. Now I'm going to skip through this because, like I said, this guy loves to talk. This is a good one. The chief difficulty, in fact, the whole task of an investigator in matters of such phenomena as Sasquatch or sea serpents is, of course, the credibility of the eyewitnesses. If untruthful, what motives lie behind their stories? So they talk a lot about sea serpents around the same time as they talk about Sasquatch, which I guess shouldn't surprise me too much because of the area, but still, the fact that they're so open with the fact that, boom, yeah, look at that, there's Sasquatch, there's, there's sea monsters, there's everything. Uh, let me skip ahead to one of the encounters. According to these members of the tribe, have seen in the springtime every fourth year the light of a great fire on one of the highest peaks in the Chehalis Range. I would love to know if that's still happening. The fires burn for four nights, rising in a very high, thin column. Sometimes it is suddenly extinguished to rise again a little later. That this is some periodic mark of return to a certain place of worship at some ancient shrine or a communication with members in some remote mountain fastness are possible conjectures. These periodic returns to some ancient gathering place do bring these people close to what are now civilized areas. A few days ago, a middle-aged Indian, Tom Cedar, was trout fishing from his canoe on Morris Creek, which is a tributary of the Harrison. He was near a rocky terraced bank. Suddenly, a large rock struck the water so close to his canoe that he was drenched by the splash. Looking up, he saw with amazement a huge hairy man above him just as he threw another rock. This one also barely missed the canoe. Cedar paddled rapidly upstream to the settlement. By the way of noting an odd coincidence, this particular stream, now called Morris Creek, was known as Saskacaw when the white man first arrived and is so called on old maps. Nearby are caverns which are investigated by Captain Ward, 40 years a resident in the district. He states they bear evidence of habitation. Upon the walls are some crude drawings. In this region, according to the Indians, two large bands of Sasquatch fought a long time ago until both were brought almost to extermination. All right, let's stop right there. We know the name of the river. We know the town. We should be able to find these caves, these caverns, which supposedly have cave drawings on there, crude cave drawings. I want to see those. I want to know if anybody's investigated these caverns. Not only that, but they should be able to figure out from where they would see these fires come from. If every four years, for as long far back as they could remember, they see these fires, Someone should be able to go up to that region, especially in a helicopter nowadays, and find out if there was anything at that location or around that location, or do one of those LIDAR detections. This has an amazing episode of Paranormal Almanac, the TV show, written for it. The search for Sasquatch, the search for crude paintings of Sasquatch in this region where they were seen forever. I really want to do this. I think it'd be amazing. So, if you're a listener and I hope you are, and you happen to be connected to the TV or film industry, and you would like to do an episode or a special episode of Paranormal Almanac, the TV show, and let's go and investigate this, I would love it. I'm completely down to do this. I think it'd be amazing. Okay, let's keep going on this story, though. The other evidence of hostile intentions of some of these creatures dates back 20 years and consists of the statements of two Indians, 
Peter and Paul Williams of Chehalis. The following is a very much condensed resume. On an evening in May, I was about a mile from the reserve, near the foot of the mountains, when what I first looked to be a bear rose up in the underbrush. It was a man between six and seven feet tall, covered with hair. I turned and ran through the underbrush to my dugout. The hairy man came after me. I paddled across the stream, which is not very deep, and the man waited after. I reached to the house where my wife and child were inside. I bolted the door. Presently, the man, the hairy man, arrived. It was growling. No, it was growing dark, sorry. He prowled around, grunting and growling, but after a little while, went away. About the same time, Paul was chased from a creek where he was fishing. But the giant did not run after him very far, and apparently the action was only to drive the man away to get the fish he had already caught. On another occasion in the next year, Peter and another man came upon two giants so close as to distinguish a man and a woman. Though the Indians ran, they were not pursued. Charlie Victor, now living at Chilliwack, relates that he and a little group of companions while bathing in a mountain lake last year near Yale, wait, in a mountain lake year Yale, I think they mean near Yale, suddenly looked up to see a huge man, naked and hairy, looking down upon them from among the trees. His eyes looked to be very kind, and I was about to speak to him when he drew back into the trees. I think this is that same story, just from a different uh, newspaper. Here we have the only eyewitnesses who gives a favorable reaction to the sight of the mysterious race. This took place many years ago and at a point about 100 miles from where the majority of the Sasquatch have been reported seen in recent times. From there they go on to the little mountain town of Agassiz. They talk about um, a bunch of people that were picnicking there. On their way to this, a man named Herbert Point and a girl, Adeline August, were walking when they saw a strange creature approaching. He was twice as big as the average man with hands so long they nearly touched the ground and his nose spread all over his face. His body was covered with hair like an animal. He stopped within 50 feet of us. We ran away as fast as we could. The line and quotes are excerpts from a letter written by the man in answer to a query about what he had seen. Within recent weeks, Emma Paul and Millie Saul, two other members of the Chehalis Reserve, saw one of the Sasquatch near their home on the fringe of the woods. Several nights later, he was heard prowling around the home of Millie Saul and once rubbed his hand over the window pane. To date, the last report was from Harrison Mills, a small hamlet on the Harrison River. The woman on hearing a humming noise... Oh, and there we go. So, step back into the laundry. So, again, a bunch of eyewitness stories from around the same time, from around the same location, but this one with a lot more detail and how we might be able to find Sasquatch if they're still going by this every four years fire for whatever reason. Really, really cool one. I absolutely love that one. Where are we at in time? Oh, that's fine. We're, we're still doing good. Okay, from there, let's go on to October 11th, 1935 from the Salina Morning Post in California and reprinted in the Times in Hammond, Indiana on October 25th, 1935. So again, the same story reprinted across the country in just a matter of a couple of weeks. This story says, Reports tell of a Canadian monster men. Settlers 50 miles from Vancouver describe hairy giants. Sasquatch men, remnants of a lost race of wild men who inhabited the rocky regions of British Columbia centuries ago, are reported roaming the province again. After, a sev after an absence of several months from the district of Harrison Mills, 50 miles east of Vancouver, the long, weird, wolf-like howls of the wild men are being heard again. And two of the hairy monsters were, were seen in the Morris Valley on the Harrison River. Residents in the district tell of seeing the two giants leaping and bounding out of the forest and striding across the duck-feeding ground, wallowing now again in the bog and mire and long, waving swamp grasses. The strange man, it was reported, after emerging from the woods, came leaping down the jagged, rocky hillside with the agility and lightness of mountain goats. Snatches of their weird language floated on the breeze across the lake to the pioneer settlement at the foot of the hills. The giants walked with an easy gait across the swamp flats and at the Morris Creek in the shadow of the Little Mystery Mountain straddled a floating log, which they propelled with their long, hairy hands and huge feet across the sluggish, glacial stream of the sluggish, oh, that's hard to say, sluggish glacial stream to the opposite side. There they abandoned the log and climbed hand over hand up the almost perpendicular cliff at a point known as Gibraltar, that is 
at a point known as Gibraltar and disappeared at the top of the ridge. They carried two large clubs and walked round a herd of cattle directly in their path. So these, this is the first time I've ever heard of Sasquatch using technically like some form of boat or flotation device and carrying clubs. This one's a really weird one. Uh, it goes on to say, the last appearance of the monsters was peaceful. They avoided the trails usually used by the people of the valley and molested neither cattle nor human beings. People who have reported seeing the giants on their rare appearances describe them as, quote, ferocious looking wild men, nine feet tall and covered from head to toe with thick black hair. Very interesting one. Very interesting. Like I said, I don't recall ever hearing of Sasquatch really using logs and or clubs. So that was really bizarre. Okay, up next is from the Press and Sun Bulletin in New York on May 23rd, 1938. And this one was reprinted in Battle Creek, Michigan's Battle Creek Inquirer on May 27th, 1938. So five days apart, same story. I'm going to go with the original one. Indians honor men of legend. 2,000 Aborigines hold rights of Sasquatch. And you're going to hear about this rights of Sasquatch quite a few times, but uh, this was the first one I could find. Indians of British Columbia, home of the Ogopogo, legendary lake-dwelling water, water snake, and his terrifying saltwater cousin, the sea serpent, paid homage today to Sasquatch, the hairy ones. An estimated 2,000 from tribes in the territory at Washington State converged on a galley, on a galley, on a gaily decorated Indian village here, bringing grotesque native masks and costumes. It's Sasquatch Indian Day, and no place for skeptics. You either take the Sasquatch or you leave them alone. There is no middle course. Many Indians take them straight. To hear, to hear tell, the Sasquatch were great, hairy, legendary creatures that maintain the reputation with an occasional present. They swoop from the mountains to peek in windows or smack down a lone tribesman. Others, Indian agent J.W. Burns explained, take a milder view. Despite their great size, about seven feet in height, the Sasquatch were timid and harmless. They were believed to be covered with a growth of hair and to live in caves and hollow trees. The legend probably came down from the actual existence of some primitive race. I believe it myself. Legend or not, the celebration today and tomorrow will see braves, squaws, and their papooses living again as their ancestors did before white man came. Against a background of historic Harrison Lake and Harrison Lake and River, an Indian village of 20 lodges bright with traditional drawings and totem symbols occupy a square mile of the cleared brushed land. Dressed in full tribal regales, Indians prepared to start the day celebration with a parade. And it goes on to talk about the night celebrations. But that's about it for the actual Sasquatch part of that story. But I never heard of Sasquatch Indian Day ever before. So I thought that one was really, really interesting. Again, British Columbia and their Sasquatch and how much they revered them and still talked about them so openly is actually pretty impressive. Okay, up next is from October 29th, 1941, from the Chilliwack Progress in British Columbia, Canada. 1941 edition of Sasquatch, twice as big as predecessors. How would you like a 14-foot tall wild man to come stalking out of the woods and walk into your home? Jimmy Douglas, who lives at Port Douglas at the head of Harrison Lake, didn't like it. With his family, he fled by canoe down the lake to Harrison Hot Springs, bearing a tale of a bearing a tale of a brush with the famous Sasquatch legendary enemy of the Chehalis Indians. Appearance of the famous man-beast struck terror into the hearts of the Indians and confirmed reports of the activity of the Sasquatch in the Ruby, Key, in the Ruby Creek District two weeks ago. So this one's actually talking about two new Sasquatch sightings. Authorities here, J.W. Burns, hey, we're just talking about him, one of the world's greatest living experts on the Sasquatch believe that the huge wild man seen at Ruby Creek is the same one in which this week sent Jimmy Douglas and his family fleeing to Harrison Hot Springs. The huge Sasquatch, twice as large as any other ever seen by natives, came out of the woods and walked slowly through the village. Indians fled to their homes and locked the doors. Douglas did not manage to bolt his in time. The Sasquatch walked in and Jimmy Douglas and his family made a hurried exit. It is pointed out that the Sasquatch appears most frequently at this time of year. Late September and October appear to be appear to be Sasquatch days. The Indians believe that the Sasquatch live in the caves in the hills near Port Douglas. Further evidence of the existence of these hairy creatures came to light in November last year when one of them was seen by a white man on the Harrison River 
quite close to Harrison Mills. The giant and the man faced each other for 20 minutes. The man was prepared to swear under oath that he had seen the Sasquatch. Several Indians were among, were along at the time, and all of them ran away declaring that the wild man was what the Indians in the Harrison district called the Sasquatch, but was known to them as ticks. That's the first time I've ever heard a Sasquatch known as ticks. These originally came from the Olympic range in the state of Washington. Again, absolutely crazy. Do I believe it was 14 feet tall? No, I believe it was probably 10 feet tall, and that's enough to scare the hell out of anybody. They don't need to be 14 feet tall. All right, this next one is from the Windsor Star. It's from November 29th, 1941. It says men eight feet tall roam mountains of British Columbia. Windsor lawyer and anthropologist gets new report on race of giants. A Windsor, a Windsor, a Windsor lawyer who is also a keen student of anthropology. Who was your first grandpappy? What the fuck does that mean? A Windsor lawyer who is a keen study of anthropology, and then it says in quotes, "Who was your first grandpappy?" has received a report from British Columbia which confirms a belief that he has long held there are giants in them thar hills. Pained by skeptics, too modest to permit his name to be used and much too serious about the subject to treat it with the, dis with the discern and ridicule with which some skeptics view it, the Windsor man is wondering why a university expedition has not been organized to run down the evidence. The story briefly is this. A race of giants exist in the mountains of British Columbia, men eight feet tall with footprints that measure 22 inches in length. These men have been seen no later than last November by Indians and at least one white man. The Windsor lawyer's latest evidence comes from the West, from the man who is co-author of a recent magazine article dealing with the subject. The magazine carrying the story, although published within the past few weeks, actually received the story 16 months ago. Since that time, further evidence has come to light. And then it goes on to say, letter from the West, to quote from the Windsor lawyer's correspondence with his Western friend. Quote, I have been delving now into the matter of wild men in British Columbia for the past 16 years, and the more I have investigated, the more I'm convinced of their existence. At the present time, I have a list of nearly a score of Indians and one white man who has encountered the giants. The white man met the giant last November on the Harrison River. The Sasquatch, or wild man, stood for 20 minutes. Hey, it's that same story. Uh, the Indians call these elusive wild men Smael Etel, S-M-A-I-L-E-T-L, -E but as the name is difficult to pronounce, I coined the name Sasquatch in 1929. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. I've been reading the word Sasquatch in the early 1800s, so you're wrong. The writer goes on to state that the name appeared for the first time in another Canadian magazine issue of April 1st, 1929. The story, he adds, gives more details in particular about the Sasquatch than are given in the more recent publications. So here's White Man trying to say that he came up with the name Sasquatch, which we all know, totally BS. But, um, gee, what a shocker that a white man is trying to take something from an indigenous people. Uh, they find traces in U.S. caves, but the real pulling power of the whole episode for the Windsor, Bar Windsor Barrister is this. During a vacation this summer, he was a visiting section. He was visiting a section of the United States noted for its cave formations. After making the unusual, I can't read. After making, oh, may, my, maybe it says the usual. After making the usual sightseers trip, he was told that some other caves had just been explored, and evidence of a race of giants was made very clear. Give me details. Mummified remains of these giant creatures lay on the floor of these caves, unscarred by time or undiscovered by science. So startling has the discovery been that no public statement has been made that no public statement has been made by Washington until government anthropologists have had ample time to make their report. What the hell, man? The Windsor man is anxiously, anxiously awaiting the story to break in the press of the United States. He has no reason to doubt the source of the evidence. It was given to him by the U.S. geologist on location at the caves. So, 1941, we have secondhand knowledge of new caves being discovered in America. Where were the, where were the caves? Visiting a section of the United States noted for its cave formations. After making the usual sightseer ship, he was told that some caves had just been discovered. So anything say if it's in the southwest, the southeast, where these caves were, just a section of the United States noted for its cave formations. And supposedly, in those caves, they found mummified remains of, of Sasquatch, a Bigfoot, laying on the floor of the caves, unscarred by time or undiscovered by science. Son of a bitch, man. So the government knows about Sasquatch, too. Again, not surprised. 
All right, the next one is a really small, quick article from Tucson, Arizona in March 17th, 1949, but it's still talking about British Columbia. And this will probably be the last one for the regular episode. Like, let me see where I'm at. Yeah, so this will be the last one for the regular episode, but patrons and anybody that wants to become a patron, I'm going to put on the full episode onto the Patreon. And I got to have, let's see, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I got at least another 10, 12 articles that are equally amazing, equally fascinating. So the full episode will be up on Patreon. You guys are going to get this not truncated. It's an hour episode. Every Paranormal Almanac's around an hour. But I still have so much more information to give you. I could either split it up into two for everybody or what I'm going to do. Here's the one for you guys. And then there'll be one for the Patreons. Okay. So let's go on to the small Tucson, Arizona article talking about British Columbia. Tall timber tails heard in the Northwest. Sasquatch and Caborosaurus, each of whom would be the catch of the year for any zoo in the country, remain allergic to the 20th century. Cadborosaurus, in fact, hasn't been heard of in many, many months. Previously, natives and fishermen claim to have obtained frequent, although momentary, glimpses of Caddy, the sea serpent, as he glided along the western Canadian coastline. Then there's Sasquatch. Ten feet tall and covered with shaggy brown hair, he completes the other half of British Columbia's prized pair of primeval relics. That's fun to say. Prized pair of primeval relics. Sasquatch supposedly emerged from the forest a short time ago, Indians long had claimed the existence of a tribe of hairy giants not far from the Washington state border. The native word for the giants is Sasquatch. Okay, let me stop right here for the regular listener. And I'm going to cut this part out for the patrons so you'll know when, like, it's going to be patronized. But um, for you, for regular listeners, what do you guys think? Hearing from these articles directly, does it give more credence to the Sasquatch story? Because I got to admit, for me, it really does. Reading these over and over again, hearing new Sasquatch tales over and over again, you can see them going from year to year to year, is absolutely fascinating for me. But do these articles make you believe in Bigfoot more? Or do you think that all of these people, everyone I've been talking about so far, Native Americans, indigenous people, hunters, settlers, all of them have been misidentifying bears this whole time? Once again, I'm your host, Kurt Sandvig, and this has been another edition of Paranormal Almanac. There were some scientists trying to figure out the Sasquatch riddle. Then they figured out it was a missing link. In search of Sasquatch, that was a kick-ass in search of with Leonard Nimoy. Kicking out the jams. Ha! Oh, forget. Fuck your snitch.